Mark LaMonica. I am the product manager for Morningstar Premium, morningstar.com.au. Today, we're going to talk about interest rates and the impact that they have on asset prices. Um, so as people are probably aware, we have pretty low interest rates, and that has had pretty significant impact on all sorts of valuations. But we will get into that after we do the housekeeping items. So number one, anything you hear today is general advice. I don't know anything about you, so I can't offer any personal advice, but I would like questions keeps it entertaining for me. So if you have any questions, please send them through. You can send them through the chat or the Q&A. You see a Q&A button on your Zoom screen. And yeah, send them along as they come in and we'll reserve some time at the end. Okay, so let's get started. Um, and yeah, the two questions we always get, is this is being recorded? Yes, it is. Will is, uh, Will is recording this and pressing buttons now. Maybe he wasn't recording it, but now he's recording it. Um, good, good reminder. But uh, Will's excited today because our new podcast equipment came. So Will's been unpacking the boxes. It's like Christmas morning here in Barangaroo. Um, anyway, this will be recorded. We'll put it on the website, or you can email me for a link. We're starting a YouTube channel also, which is exciting, I guess. So, uh, so they'll all be available on there as well. So how do interest rates impact asset values? All right, so what we have here is a chart, a chart that is going down significantly. Now, obviously, look at the end of this chart. This is not the most recent chart, but we're going to talk about the overall level of interest rates, what's been happening with them historically over, uh, over the long term, and what influence that's going to have on us as investors and what we're going to do. So what we're looking at here is the Australian cash rate. So the cash rate is the interest rate on unsecured overnight loans um, between the Reserve Bank of Australia and banks. So this is really the rate that central banks use, or in Australia, the central bank, but banks around the world in their own individual countries use to control interest rates. So when you hear things like interest rates have gone down or gone up or anything else, we're really talking about this rate. And we'll talk about some of the other ways that central banks have been manipulating interest rates as well. Manipulate's a bad word, controlling. Um, maybe that's bad too. Anyway, maybe there's no good word. But, uh, but yeah, this is the primary rate. And so what this does, of course, is this impacts funding costs for banks which ripple throughout the whole economy. And the whole point of monetary policy, and monetary policy is what central banks do to uh, do with interest rates, to try to get the economy to do certain things, is the whole point is that monetary policy is supposed to influence interest rates across the board in, um, in certain countries, and that's supposed to influence economic activity. So it certainly influences the activity between borrowers and lenders, which we can get into. And it also has impacts on things like the level of employment and inflation. And if you think about level of employment and inflation, those are the two things that central banks are trying to manage. So most central banks around the world, including here in Australia, are trying to strike a balance between those two things. They are trying to um, create a situation where we do have full employment, and full employment is not 100% employment, but that we do have full employment, and also a situation where inflation is under control, which is generally characterized as under 2%. But we'll talk about more about that. So we've got two different um, two different uh, policies that interest that central banks can have so they can be expansionary or contractionary so expansionary is we're trying to expand the economy that means lower interest rates so what we're trying to do is get more economic activity going in the hopes that that will of course lower unemployment and then contractionary is when the economy is overheating and we're trying to slow it down so that means higher interest rates so what you can see here is on this chart, which should be very obvious, that since 1990, there has been a giant fall in interest rates. So this is obviously Australia that we're talking about here, but this is echoed around the world. And that's the phase that most investors um, today have been investing in. So they've been investing in a, a, um, a period of time where interest rates have been dropping. You obviously see some fluctuations, but overall they've come down. They are next to zero right now. Um, so obviously since this chart where we're still at what one and a half percent on this chart they've come down even more so they're at 25 basis points now in Australia so a quarter of a percent 
So this is one thing that central banks do. The other thing central banks started doing during the global financial crisis, and which really accelerated during, um, during COVID, is they have been doing what they deem as open market operations. And open market operations basically means that they are going out and they are um, buying bonds. So basically, we've heard about this quantitative easing. That's what this is. So they're going out and they're buying longer dated government bonds. That was during the GFC to try to keep interest rates lower across the yield curve. Then during the GSC, they started going out, particularly in the US, and they started buying mortgage-backed securities. So those are securitized mortgages. And of course, because there were problems in the housing market, what they were trying to do is keep liquidity in the housing market to make sure that anyone that wanted to buy a home, while well, these homes were being repossessed, any new buyers could go out there and access a loan, and that interest rates were low so that they would want to go buy a house. As we moved into, uh, as we moved into COVID, they expanded this again. They started buying corporate bonds. And the concern that central banks had during this time is that because the economy was going to slow down or shut down for potentially an extended period of time, which turned out to be true, they were worried that companies would go out of business because they wouldn't have the cash flow to get through these periods of lower economic activity. So they wanted to keep corporate rates low. So they started buying corporate bonds. And in the US, the Federal Reserve went so far as they actually bought ETFs that invested in bonds, thinking that's easier. I'll just buy the ETF instead of going out and buying all the individual bonds. Now, that may or may not have been <laughs> legal. Um, so they're still sorting through that. But basically, it's just showing how much central banks were working to get um, to get interest rates lower. And what they've done is they basically think about it, they've expanded their balance sheet. So a central bank can write a just check out of an unlimited, um, an unlimited bank account because they create the money supply. So what they're doing is they're adding all of these assets to their balance sheet. So they're adding all of these bonds. Now they're collecting interest on these bonds and everything else. And in theory, everything will be okay as long as, uh, as long as nobody defaults on the bonds. But the problem with this is, some people think it's a problem, is they're dramatically expanding the money supply. So anyway, that's the history that, uh, that we've had. And what we're going to explore today, as I said earlier, is we're going to explore how this will actually impact asset values. And this is particularly important now, because with rates close to zero, we maybe need to start considering as investors, what's going to happen when interest rates start going up? And one of the reasons that interest rates go up, as we talked about before, is because of inflation. Now, central banks have come out around the world and said that they're not raising interest rates for years. They've said they'd be more comfortable with higher inflation, but we'll see what happens. We've seen some strange stuff in the market so far this year around interest rates and central banks, so we'll have to see what happens. But that's what we need to prepare ourselves um, for as investors. So let's start with fixed interest. So we'll talk about fixed interest, then we'll go on to equities, and we will touch on um, housing. I know everyone likes to think that housing prices have gone up because they've redone their kitchen, but interest rates have a pretty big, uh, a pretty big impact on that as well. Okay, so let's look at fixed interest. Fixed interest is where there's the most direct impact between interest rates and returns and asset values. And we'll run through a little bit of an example. So we've got two different scenarios here. We've got newly issued bonds. And then secondary bonds. So all that means is newly issued is when, if I'm a government or a corporation or anyone else who's issuing bonds, which are debt, what happens when I actually interest when I actually issue that bond? So we've got a three percent interest rate environment. So let's go through this. So I want to issue a bond. I can borrow at that three percent interest rate. So we can think of that interest rate as either the risk-free rate if you're a government, or just the interest rate that they're pricing my debt at if I'm a corporate issuer, um, which means that incorporates basically the default risk into it. So I can issue at 3%. So I issue a $100 bond, it means I'm borrowing $100, means I'm going to pay back the bondholder $3 a year, and that gives it a yield of 3%, which is the interest rate. Five years, I'm going to pay them back that $100. So what does this get priced at? It gets priced at $100 when it's released. And the reason it gets priced at $100 is because it's matching the interest rate. The coupon payment's matching the interest rate. So then if we go over and look at 
or we look a year from now, so a year passes, and interest rates have fallen to 2%. So now, that's good for me if I'm this corporation or government because I can borrow for cheaper. So I can do the same thing. Now, this year, I can get $100 for a $2 coupon payment, a 2% yield, there's four years left in it, $100. So if I want to borrow a four-year four year, um, bond at that point, if I want to borrow 100 bucks for four years. So, and a lot of corporations like this, of course, because as interest rates fall, if they have debt outstanding, they can just refinance that de debt at a lower rate and pay off the old debt. Um, so this is an example that could happen. But what happens if I bought the bond? So I bought the bond at 3%, and now it's a year later, and I want to sell my bond. So. It's still face value $100, meaning I'll get $100 back in now four years. I get $3 a year for, uh, for a coupon payment. The yield now is going to adjust to 2% because that's what the market is paying. So what does that mean? It means the price of my bond goes up because I'm getting $3 a year where now everyone's paying $2 a year off 100, right? So the price is going to adjust. Now, this is why bonds go up in value when interest rates fall. So bond prices move inversely to interest rates. Interest rates go down, bond prices go up. Now, of course, the opposite is also true. So bond or, uh, interest rates go up, bond prices go down. And they can go down pretty significantly. So everyone thinks that bonds don't have a lot of volatility, and generally they don't, because generally interest rates move pretty slowly. Um, generally they, uh, so yeah, generally they move pretty slowly. So there isn't a lot of volatility, a lot of price bouncing around. But if I have longer term bonds, and I am in an environment where interest rates are continually going up, the price is gonna move significantly. Now, if we go back to this chart we had before, what do you think happened during this whole period? Well, it was a great period to be a bond investor. So obviously there's lots of different, or I won't say obviously, there are lots of different types of bonds and there's lots of different things that influence their price. But in general, people are getting five to 7% returns a year from bonds. Really, really strong returns. Now, what's gonna happen now? Well, I don't know where interest rates are gonna go, but I do know if they go up, this is gonna be a really bad period to be a bond investor. And I also know if they stay the same, this is gonna be a really bad period to be a bond investor. So if you think about it, if I'm buying fixed interest right now, I'm getting no income, basically, because interest rates are so low. There's basically no opportunity for price appreciation, because while I don't know if interest rates are gonna go up, I'm pretty sure they're not gonna go down, or they're not gonna go down a lot. You're never gonna have that period of that 14% to 25 basis points where we've gone now. You just cannot have that period from where interest rates are right now. So we talked about this the other day with the 4% rule, but you're just not getting that return going forward. And that's just math. Now, there's some weird parts of the bond market around sort of high yield bonds or junk bonds where credit quality determines much more of the returns, but just with general safe government bonds or corporate bonds, you're just not gonna get a good return. And that, yeah, unfortunately is just math. All right. So let's look at what you should do if you're a fixed interest investor. I have a couple examples on here. Um, so I took this from Vanguard on the left, and then I took this from BlackRock, iShares on the right. They're both ETFs. Now, a lot of people go and they access fixed interest through ETFs. Now, one of the things that happens to me, if I just buy a bond, I can just wait for maturity. And I know what my return is going to be as long as whoever I bought the bond from is going to pay me back. All right, so if I go buy a government bond and I'm sure the government's gonna pay me back, I know exactly what my return will be. So if I buy a 10-year bond at a 3% coupon rate, I know what I'm gonna make off of that because I'm gonna get my principal back at the end. I'm gonna get $3 a year for 10 years um, in the $100 example. So I know exactly what that is. And so while that bond price may fluctuate over time, if I'm just holding it, it doesn't really matter. Now this was good in higher interest rate environments for some people. Um, because if I would have gone back and bought a 14% bond 
back in 1990 and I was holding it for 30 years, well, I just got paid back. Um, I was making 14% on that bond every single year. So that's pretty good, right? It'd be pretty good if, you know, a year ago I was holding a bond and for every $100 of face value, they were paying me $14 back when everyone else is trying to put money in the bank where you're getting nothing from the bank. So you can always keep that bond. Now, obviously, that bond appreciated a lot in price. But most people access fixed interest through an ETF or a fund. And that's where we need to start worrying about interest rate risk. And there's all sorts of different things that influence bond prices, as I said. So it's the shape of the yield curve. Lots of stuff we don't need to get into unless people have questions on it. But what you're looking at when you are investing in an ETF, if you want to measure the amount of risk that you are going to have to deal with, um, you need to look at the duration of a bond. So this is from Vanguard's page right here, effective duration. This is from BlackRock's page, effective duration. So what duration means, and duration is often measured in years, which makes it a little bit confusing. So 6.1 years. What duration means is that is the percent that a bond will go down or up in value if there is the inverse change in interest rates of 1%. So what this means is that and these are estimates, but they're generally pretty close. So what this means for this Vanguard Australian Fixed Interest ETF, if I own this ETF and I see that the effective duration is 6.1 years, it means that if interest rates go up 1%, I will lose 6.1% of my money. So that's the math behind duration. Now, as I said, there's a yield curve, meaning that there's different bonds with different maturities that change a little bit, but for all practical purposes, that's what this means. So when people are investing in fixed interest and they say that they're not going to lose money or there's not going to be volatility, yeah, if you buy a bond directly from somebody, you're not going to lose money as long as they pay you back. But you are going to lose money if you invest in an ETF or a fund because all the time they are switching around what's in there, um, whether it's actively managed or whether it's just following an index. So be very careful. So 6.1% is a big loss. So if you invested in this Vanguard Australian fixed interest ETF and you thought there was no risk, well, there's a pretty big risk. Um, and the risk is not default that you're worried about. The risk is changes in interest rates. I mean, obviously, if the Australian government defaulted, well, you frankly have, we'd all have a lot more problems. But that's the risk in that one. If we go look at this iShares, this duration is less. So 3.68. So that means if interest rates go up 1%, you only lose 3.68. Um, percentage of your investment, which I guess is better. So, and the reason for this is based on the bond characteristics, it will influence this duration. Um, so whether it's a longer term bond or a shorter term bond, that's going to, uh, that's gonna mean that things are going to change in different places, where you are from an interest rate perspective. Um, so this is a high yield bond fund. So what does that mean? They're investing in junk bonds. So, and it's global. So what they're doing, so it's global, AUD hedge, that means no currency impact, but they're investing in junk bonds. So they're investing bonds that basically move more like equities, because these are companies people don't think are necessarily gonna pay them back. Um, so, uh, and you can see 12 month trailing yield, you're getting pretty good, 5.47%, which is pretty good. Here you're getting nothing, right? So you're getting 0.7, so you're getting less than a percent out of this one. But anyway, that is, uh, that's just a, it's not a trick, but that's something you should know if you're a fixed interest investor. If you're investing in ETFs, yeah, go look at those, uh, go look at those effective durations because that can show you how much risk is actually in these, especially if we're worried about your interest rates going up. All right, so that's the end of that. Now we're gonna talk about equities and we get to go play with a spreadsheet. But first, let's talk conceptually around equities. So there's a couple different things that happen um, that influence equity valuations with interest rates. And the first one that's pretty simple to explain, so I always started there, is just the substitution effect. And we've seen this, right? So a lot of people, and we talked about this back with that, um, 
when we're talking about the 4% rule, is that traditionally, a lot of people invested much more in fixed interest, particularly as they're getting into retirement, and still did pretty well. So all these um, past scenarios of returns, with looking at different portfolio asset allocations, the fact that bonds return 5 to 7% a year since 1990, or even mainly kind of the mid-'80s, the fact that all of that, uh, the fact that that's been happening means that you're still getting really, really good returns from that fixed interest portion of your portfolio. And the funny thing is everyone talks about bonds, how they don't have a lot of volatility. Well, in that case, there was volatility, but it was all the bond price going up. Um, so people weren't too worried about it. But, um, but yeah, if we start sitting there and looking at different parts of the portfolio, that's what we're facing. So what's the substitution effect? Well, the substitution effect is people are starting to do what I was talking about, that as interest rates go down, it becomes a lot less attractive to invest in a bond. It also becomes a lot less attractive to keep cash in the bank. If you're heading into retirement, you're trying to generate income, you can't generate income from fixed interest right now because the yields are too low. So what have people been doing? They've been substituting equities. So that's the substitution effect. And that drives equity prices up as well because there's more demand for them. So people have been going out and they've been investing in dividend paying stocks because they're trying to get income and they're sitting there and thinking, why should I have money sitting in the bank earning nothing? And why should I go out and buy fixed interest when I'm getting nothing from a coupon? So the easy way to explain this is the substitution effect. And that's certainly one impact. And if you look at portfolios now, the 60-40 portfolio, there aren't a lot of people that are in that right now. People are upping that equity allocation. But then the other way that um, you really have an impact on equities is the way that we value equity. So we're going to go back into our fund model spreadsheet, just as a reminder um, for people that were not on the how to value an equity one. So the very quick reminder is the way that we value equities is we use a discounted cash flow model. What that means is we are estimating into the future cash flows, and then we're discounting them back to the present day. And we're discounting them back because a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in the future. So what are we discounting them back by? Well, different people discount back by different things. But either way, whether it's the weighted average cost of capital that we use, whether it's a risk-free rate plus an equity risk premium sitting on top of that, no matter what, they are lower when interest rates are lower because the level of interest rates has a huge influence on that. Um, so what happens if you discount back by a lower number? Well, you're taking less of a discount of those future cash flows, meaning they're worth more, which means the company is worth more. So we've done this, and we'll talk about which companies are worth more in a second. So we've done this, we've estimated out cash flows, so this is the same spreadsheet we used before. So we've estimated out cash flows into the future. We've discounted them back, in this case, by 10%. So that 10% weighted average cost of capital is giving you those present values, giving you the value of the equity, which is that, plus the terminal value. So there's a couple of different places. We don't go through the whole thing again. But this thing's worth $24.25 in this little scenario. All right, so what happens if I change this to five? Now it's worth $71.97. So falls in interest rates have very, very large impacts on the way that we value equities. So over that whole time period that we're going through, um, and we'll go back to that spreadsheet in a second, but if we go back, oh, here we go. It's a good thing I got my mouse well. Um, if we go back to this period of time and we look at valuation levels from 1990 and we look at them now, they have gone up a ton. So investors are willing to pay a lot more for companies right now. Now, we can get into arguments whether this is a bubble or not a bubble or where we are, but regardless, valuation levels have gone up and it makes sense that they went up because interest rates went down. And the degree to which they went up, we can argue, and there's a lot of things pointing to perhaps they've gone up way too much. Um, but at the same time, it makes sense that valuation levels come up. But once again, what is our problem right now? Our problem as investors is that we're sitting here with interest rates close to zero. So is it likely, same thing with fixed interest, is it likely that valuation levels are going to continue to go up or even stay the same over the next 30-year period? 
And in my opinion, the answer is no, because interest rates at the very least are not going to fall. They're not going to juice our equity returns by falling. Most likely, they're going to start going up at some point. And what that's going to do is that's going to change the valuation levels of equities. All the analysts and all the portfolio managers and everyone else who all basically use some form of a discounted cash flow model somewhere in their, um, in their process for picking stocks, they're all going to go back in there and they're going to start adjusting them. And it won't be huge changes. I made a really big change there, right? I went from 10% to 5%. But over time, as interest rates go up, valuations are going to go down. So as an investor in equities, how do I make money? Well, a couple different things. One, the company can grow. The valuation level can stay the same. So I, well, if we use price to earnings, so if I am going to pay $10, or if I'm going to pay 10 times earnings for a company, that's great. If the earnings grow, if it's $1, and then all of a sudden it's $2 in some future period of time, well, it's going to double in price. So instead of paying $10 for that share, I'm going to pay $20 for the share using that share uh, using that same multiple. Now, if the multiple goes up and all of a sudden investors are starting to pay 15 times earnings for something, well, now I'm making a lot more money. So all of a sudden, when it gets up to $2, now the share is worth 30 instead of 20 and much higher than the 10 it originally was. So you're getting extra return from valuation levels going up. So the returns that we've seen, and this is what we're talking about, that 4% um, uh, withdrawal rate um, conversation, 4% rule, is all the returns that have happened in the last 30 years are very, very, very unlikely to repeat themselves in the future because you're not going to get interest rates falling and you're not going to get that valuation increase over time. Um, and this is also true, by the way, in, in housing. Right? So once again, we won't spend a lot of time in housing because I'm certainly not an expert in it, but interest rates really matter for housing. And we've seen that in Australia, and we've seen that recently. Um, but interest rates falling have increased housing prices a lot. And we can all argue about all the different impacts, whether that's net migration. Um, there's all sorts of things we can argue about. But interest rates have increased housing prices because as interest rates go down, any asset's going to start to get priced more. Because the way most people buy houses, and it makes sense, is they walk into the bank and they say, I make this much money. Here's some of my expenses. How much can I afford? And what impacts how much you can afford? Interest rates. So if you own a house already and interest rates fall a lot and people can afford a different house or a bigger house, like that's going to make all housing values go up. So once again, are housing values going to go up the same amount that they've gone up before? I wouldn't bank on it, personally, um, just because interest rates are not going to keep falling because they can't keep falling. So anyway, that is, my, uh, that is my little bit of an interest rate discussion slash rant. But let's talk about specifically what you can do as an investor now. So it's not a great time period to be an investor if we're looking at forward returns. If we're looking at past returns, it has been a great period to be an investor. So a couple things. Number one, um, you know, I think people should be very, very cognizant that past returns are not going to happen in the future. And if they do, and I'm wrong, then good for you. You'll just get higher returns. Um, but I think when we start to estimate out how much we need to save, how much we need to invest to hit future goals, if you are using past returns, you're going to run into a little bit of a problem, I think, because I don't think they're going to be as high in the future. And that's across all asset classes. So whether it's equity, fixed interest, or housing. Um, so that's the first thing. The other thing is think about what are the types of companies that get impacted um, by rising interest rates and falling interest rates. So I, I just looked at the market at a whole and how you value, value companies at a whole, but there are some companies that actually do okay when interest rates go up. And a big one is banks. Um, so if you look at sort of any part of the banking sector, um, you know, number one, they generally have huge cash holdings. Um, because they need to, and huge cash and fixed interest holdings. So that's one thing. So there are all sorts of requirements on banks that, of course, they need to hold cash reserves and fixed interest reserves. And yeah, there's various tiers of capital they have to hold. But either way, 
they have to hold a lot of cash and fixed interest um, investment. So if they are actually higher, if interest rates are higher, they're going to make more money off of that. Um, so that is, uh, that is one thing. So think about banks. Um, and a lot of this goes directly down to earnings because there isn't any increase um, from uh, – there's an increased expense from this. So that is the opportunity to, uh, to potentially profit from this. Now, banks have not done well recently. Um, so, and one of, one of the things that, uh, one of the um, parts of the market that banks are part of, they're generally value stocks. And value stocks have done really poorly. And value stocks in general could do a lot better um, in, uh, in a higher interest rate environment comparative to growth stocks. Because I showed you that model where we changed those, um, where we changed that weighted average cost of capital, or we changed the amount that we're discounting back future cash flows. But think about two different companies. A growth company, where a lot of the value of that company is baked far into the future, because it's going to continue to grow and grow and grow and grow, what happens if we lower that, uh, sorry, what happens if we raise that discount rate? Well, what's going to happen is it's going to have a bigger impact on those companies because their cash flows are way out in the future. So potentially value could perform better. And we've seen some of this recently. So people that have been following what's happened in the market is we've had, spike is the wrong word, but we've had increases of in, in interest rates, both in the US and Australia and around the world. And they've been followed by kind of sharp sell-offs of Technology stocks is the headline that everyone's given, but really what it is is growth stocks. That growth stocks have sold off pretty substantially a couple days um, over, the past, uh, over the past month, month and a half as interest rates have gone up. And the reason interest rates are going up is they're starting to be fears that inflation is potentially coming back into the economy. And when there's inflation, it forces central banks to raise interest rates. And it also, um, it also makes it worse for you just in general as a fixed interest. Um, investors, you're going to demand higher interest rates um, no matter what, because you're worried that inflation will eat away any return you have. So we're starting to see those worries. Now, the central banks have responded by, once again, going out there and buying a lot of bonds um, to try to keep them lower, and they've controlled them. But the question is, will there be a period when they stop? And I think the market's a little spooked right now that that might actually happen. Um, all right. OK, so we've got a good question. So ask any questions you have. So we've got a good question from Edward. So Edward says, if interest rates turn negative, will increase value of shares even further? Yes. So let's talk about negative interest rates because uh, hey, I'm one of the people that have a hard time wrapping my head around this. But interest rates can go negative. We've seen it in Europe. Um, so a couple countries in Europe have actually had negative interest rates. And what a negative interest rate <laughs> means is basically you are paying for the privilege of lending someone money. Now, why would anyone do this is the big question. And the reason someone would do this is because they think they'll go even more negative. Um, so if they go even more negative, what that will do is that will, of course, raise the price of the bond that you hold. Um, so it seems wacky that anyone would ever do this, but they are. So interest rates actually, and I don't think a lot of people really thought that this was ever going to happen, but interest rates fell below zero, and people are still buying government debt, um, which, uh, which is really interesting. So yeah. I said that interest rates can't fall anymore. I guess they could keep getting negative. Um, the, uh, yeah, the question is, like, how long could this actually last? Um, but, yeah, if interest rates continue to go down, so, which means they're basically going negative. So in Australia, that would mean they would have to go negative. Um, yeah, once again, that would be an opportunity where, of course, valuations went up. And nobody's, and you're never going to get negative interest rates. Nobody, the bank's not going to pay you to go buy a house and get a mortgage. But it means that every rate in the economy would come down. So, right, if you think about the risk-free rate, which is basically what governments pay, if they go negative, everything else could come down as well. Um, so that could be an opportunity to, uh, for everything that I said was going to happen to not happen. Um, all right. So let's see. We've got a question from Paul. So Paul is saying regarding ETFs, especially tech thematic, 
all issuers disclose price to earnings, some provide price to book. Question, should price to book be mandatory? Also, what about debt to equity to assess gearing, especially during these times of cheap credits? Yeah, okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about that and we'll use an example. Um, all right, sorry, I don't know where I am. Oh, let me share this. No. Okay, I am going to go to figure out how to share my screen. All right, so let's use an example of a ETF. Um, so if I go on to, all right, so let's think of a ETF that we can use. We need to go on to ETFs. We changed around this page today, by the way, in case anyone's interested. <laughs> I'm interested. All right, so let's go on to an S&P 500 ETF, and we'll just look at what the question was about, and then we can talk specifically around technology, because um, it was talking about a technology ETF. All right, so I'm looking at an iShares S&P 500 ETF, so iShares means a BlackRock product, S&P 500, 500 largest stocks in the US, um, and what we're talking about. So yeah, most, and I won't go to a actual provider page because that could take me a little bit to find it, um, but I know our website better. So yeah, what we do at Morningstar is we'll give you all those figures um, for an ETF. So basically what this is doing is we're looking at those underlying holdings in the ETF and we're looking at what's the price to earnings, price to book value, you've got price to sales, so that's revenue, cash flow, dividend yield, et cetera. So we'll give you all those underlying stats even if the actual provider doesn't, um, doesn't give them. So you can go and check out what's going on with the fund, or ETF in this case. But the question we were asking is, um, should price to book be mandatory? Also about what about debt to equity gearing, especially in times of cheap debt. So let's talk about, and you said especially a tech thematic ETF. So let's talk a little bit about technology. So. Um, Price earnings make sense for everyone, right? So price to earnings is how much you're actually gonna pay on the earnings. Price to book, or how much people are paying on earnings. Price to book is an interesting one, particularly when we talk about technology. Now, book value of a company is basically the company's assets minus their liabilities. And we talked about this one on a previous one. Traditionally, what it took for a company to make money is lots and lots of assets. Um, so the reason, and we'll use a simple example, if you go back and it's, I don't know, the 1950s or even the 1980s, I don't pick a year, and to produce goods and services, and generally we're talking about goods here, as a company, you needed a factory. So factories cost a lot of money, and factories are also assets that are held on the balance sheet of a company. And if you wanted to expand as a company, you had to build another factory, because if you wanted to sell more stuff, you had to make more stuff. So you have these very asset heavy companies. So when we go back and we read things like Ben Graham, and remember when he was writing, so he's writing in the 40s, we go back and read Ben Graham, he will talk about price to book value all the time. And the reason he'll talk about that, because the companies in his day were generally manufacturing companies, they were, um, well, we'll just stick with manufacturing companies. They were um, companies, financials. Financials have big balance sheets because they have to hold a bunch of capital. Um, all these companies that had big, um, that had a lot of assets and potentially a lot of debt as well, but a lot of assets. So when he was looking at price to book value, he was trying to find a company. And originally what he was trying to find is companies that were actually selling less than their book value. So companies that had more assets than it was actually selling for. So they might have $20 worth of assets and the price of the share, $20 per share of assets, and the price of the share was $10. So that stuff doesn't happen anymore. So the sort of focus on book value is, I don't know, it's old. Yeah, so it's pretty old. Another reason why it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen because of valuation levels, but the other reason it doesn't happen is companies are completely different now. So now we've got these companies where there's you know six people sitting in a room and then they go out and sell it for hundreds of millions of dollars and they don't have any assets, they have a couple computers and that's it. So the classic example we always use is Instagram, that they sold Instagram for a billion dollars to Facebook and they had something like 13 employees. They had no factories, they, I mean, I think it was before a lot of sort of the cloud 
computing side of things, so maybe they had some servers, but they had 13 people. That would be unthinkable if we go back because you needed assets. You need a lot of capital for those assets. You need a lot of people that were working there to, uh, to make sure that you're building something. Or if you're more of a services company, you had to have all these people servicing people. Well, all these companies scale a lot. So that's a long way of saying, Paul, that I wouldn't worry too much about price to book value when you're looking at pure technology companies because it's gonna be huge. It's just gonna be a really, really high number. The other thing, if we're looking at debt to equity, um, yeah, I think debt to equity is certainly something you wanna look at. A lot of companies have gone out and issued a lot of debt um, in the past 10 years. And the reason they've been doing this is of course, because debt's really cheap. So they've been issuing debt to expand. A lot of companies have been issuing debt to buy back shares because they haven't been able to grow much. So instead they've grown earnings per share by buying back shares. So there's less shares. So yeah, you should look at debt to equity. A lot of kind of the classic technology companies have a ton of cash because their business model is so good that, uh, that they don't have a lot of assets, they don't need to invest more. So in that factory example, um, where you build a factory, you're doing well, you sell all the goods from that one factory, all of a sudden you have to build another factory, these technology companies just scale. So that same thing with the 13 people at Instagram is that, hey, maybe if you get another 20 million customers, you'll have to hire two more people, but it's not like you need to build a new factory. So these companies are generating a lot of cash. So look at debt to equity, Absolutely. Also look at their cash levels. Um, okay, so Paul's asking, price to book value, would it be a value, would it be a valid metric um, for, he's using REITs, so real estate investment trust. Yeah, there's certainly sectors where price to book value still makes sense. So I think financials is one of them, um, where people are holding a lot, of, uh, a lot of assets, or banks are holding a lot of assets, for example. REITs, of course, are very asset heavy companies, and they're very asset heavy companies because they have to go buy the building. Um, so somebody owns this building that we're in, lend lease maybe, I don't know. Somebody owns this building, you have to carry that building. So that's something that you carry on your balance sheet as an asset, and then you finance that company, that building somehow. So you've issued debt potentially, so that's a liability on your balance sheet. So when we're looking at the difference, when we're looking at book values, so the assets basically minus the liabilities, yeah, you could look to pr price to book. But what I think you'd wanna do with price to book is within those industries where it makes sense, those asset heavy industries, compare it to different companies in the industry. Don't compare it to the market as a whole, because the market's dominated more and more by these tech companies and things like that. And don't compare it to other sectors where it doesn't make sense. But yeah, if you were going out there and looking at two different REITs, yeah, price to book value might be something you would look at. Um, all right, we've got a question from Lisa of Alpaca fame. Um, okay, so, so Lisa's saying if the price of growth stocks falls due to an increase in interest rates, at the same time the price of bonds falls for the same reason, does this mean that the only respite for investors is value stocks at such a time? Okay, yeah, I should have, uh, so sorry Lisa, I should have clarified that. When I was looking at, when I was looking at growth stocks and value stocks, what I'm saying is that interest rates, falling interest rates, potentially will impact value stocks less. I mean, sorry, raising interest rates will potentially impact value stocks less. So I'm looking at a direct comparison. That doesn't mean both are not gonna go down. Um, so that's something important to think about. I'm just saying that purely from a valuation model, and as we're looking at, we're looking at growth stocks who have outperformed value stocks since the GFC, and pretty significantly, especially lately, what would it take to get a rotation back into value stocks? So value stocks outperform growth stocks. Well, potentially interest rates going up. Um, so that's why we've seen this big sell-off in what is being characterized by people's tech stocks, but really we've seen this sell-off on these sort of value stocks where a lot of their value in terms of the um, cash flows that they're gonna generate are way in the future um, because their growth rate is so high that's what I'm saying. They could both go down um, just in a relative comparison <laughs> standpoint. Um, you could see value stocks outperform. Um, so people have been waiting for this kind of rotation back into value stocks for a very long time. And it just hasn't happened because it's been the same company. So we did a podcast on this 
maybe a webinar or two. Um, it's these same companies, so we sort of concentrated on these five. Um, so Alphabet, Google's parent company, Microsoft, Amazon, um, Apple, and who am I missing? Uh, I'm missing somebody, uh, Facebook. So we sort of concentrate on this five, but there's really, I think in the past three years, I think the top 15 stocks, or 15 stocks in the S&P 500, if we throw a couple more in there, Netflix, Tesla, things like that. I think there's been the study saying 15 stocks accounted for 97% of the return in the S&P 500. Um, so it's this very specific cohort of growth stocks that have done really, really well, which means 485 of the stocks in the S&P 500 didn't do anything in the past three years. So I think what you know we're talking about here is we're talking about, okay, what's gonna happen? Um, is it gonna be these 485 stocks that are actually gonna have better returns or still the market's gonna get dragged by these 15? So that's, that's what I was talking about. Um, and go back and look at it, it was, it was a different scenario, but if you go back and look at what happened after the dot-com bust, value stocks actually did really well. Um, so all these high-flying internet made up companies back then, pets.com and stuff like that, um, they did, uh, they of course all crashed and the NASDAQ crashed significantly, but value stocks actually did okay. Um, so maybe we're in another one of those scenarios. It's, uh, yeah, obviously not my, uh, I shouldn't be the one saying that, but um, but yeah, potentially we could be in one of those scenarios where the market goes down because we're seeing a pretty significant drop by these big companies that have come to dominate the market. Maybe it's an opportunity for other uh, for other stocks to do better. And I, I would say in Australia, you know, if we sit there and look at Australia um, because of the sectors that are on the market here. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a very different story here. Um, we certainly don't have as many high-flying technology stocks. Um, but yeah, just a, just a thought. All right, so ask questions if you have any. The last thing I'll show you is where to find this, since everyone always asks me where to find these replays. Oh, I don't want to go there. I should know where stuff is. Yeah, so basically we post them all in here. So this is our latest, uh, our latest round in January. So I went to learn to invest, then I went into this investing boot camp. So you can go back and see the videos. So who knows when Will will get this next video up because he's too busy unpacking all of his exciting podcast equipment um, and complaining about the price of cables. And uh, anyway, we'll get it up in the next couple of days. Um, so if there aren't any more questions, well, I think we can finish early today, which is exciting. So what I will say is we will put up um, we will put up another list of webinars. So I think we've only got one left in this series, but apparently we're doing this till the end of time, Will. So we'll put up a, uh, another list of the next topics, and we'll send out an email next week um, so you can register for those. So anyway, thank you guys very much. I hope everyone has a good day. Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest.